Thanks so much. That is so nice of you. So um, what I what I want to do is just kind of outline what we will be doing. Uh, we have about a 30 minute program and we will play live just a snippet at the beginning. And then we have we recorded most of it last night because we felt the sound quality was better. But between recordings, we'll be talking. Um, so you will see us and, and I encourage you to ask questions either via the chat or in between pieces if you have, if you want to uh, unmic, if you have a question about it. All four pieces are by women composers. Um, for the last, oh, a long time actually, what, three years? Hillary has uh, focused on um, uh, female black composers, so we'll play one of her pieces. And uh, we gave driveway concerts, besides the ones to vote, which were primarily historically marginalized composers. We also did things like the swan because you have to play the swan, right? So we did those for neighborhoods. Uh, we did them actually for three different neighborhoods, four, four different places that we ended up doing them. One in Ruth's, uh, Ruth's porch, that was kind of fun. Um, so anyway, and I, I, you should all know, I think some of you heard at the beginning, Hillary is leaving uh, very soon and going back to Atlanta where she gets to perform in Carmen. So you think of that dum, ba, da, 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 the opening, she gets it. It's mm -hmm. going to be a big cello solo with nine musicians in the pit and all kinds of safety measures. So we're really, really happy about that. So the first two pieces we'll play um, are by Amy Marcy Beach. And probably many of you have heard of her, but I'd like to give you, uh, as the true musicologist that I am, <laughs> I have to give you a little background about her. She's been called the Dean of American Women Composers. And it turns out, I learned things as I was researching it, that she nurtured and mentored many young female composers. So we, it, we're, it, she's kind of our Nadia Boulanger, uh, which is kind of cool to think of her in that way. She's also, a person who is identified as part of the Boston Six, which again, I learned, I've never heard of the Boston Six. Like Les Six in France, the Boston Six were Chadwick, Parker, Payne, Foote, and McDowell. Um, and she was friends with McDowell and received many different McDowell fellowships. And that in fact is where she mentored uh, from 1921 on, she mentored a lot of women at the McDowell colony. Super prodigy. This little girl at one knew 40 songs. I mean, we have grandchildren and I think they should know 40 songs, but I doubt they do. <laughs> um, by two, she could sing counterpart to those songs. And by four, she was composing. So she was really quite remarkable. She was raised in Boston. At 16, she played with Boston Symphony, then married at 18, she married a doctor who was 24 years older than she was. And I will read you what the contract was. The marriage was conditioned upon, this sounds like Fanny Mendelssohn, conditioned upon her willingness to live according to his status and function as a society matron and patron of the arts. This is 1890, right around 1890. She agreed never to teach piano, an activity widely associated with women and regarded as providing pin money because she wouldn't need it, right? Because she was so wealthy. She further agreed to limit her performances to two public recitals per year with profits donated to charity and to devote herself to composition. Uh, very similar actually to what Clara Schumann did. She, once she married Robert, she said, oh, I'm not going to perform outside the home anymore. And she composed and then of course went back to it when her husband passed away as did Amy Marcy Beach. Um, so her husband was 20 years, four years older and he dies in 1910. And she goes back to the stage. She lives in Europe for quite a while after that. But I don't wanna depict this as something where her husband was, you know, this was a condition of her marriage but she says, I was so happy. And he was content and it was, I belonged to a happy period that may never come again. So 
apparently she welcomed this. This also reminds me of Fanny Mendelssohn, whose father said, oh, you may not you may not go out and make your living as a musician. The lot of a housewife is what you're supposed to do. But at least in Amy's case, she welcomed that. Uh, so really an interesting thing. First wrote art songs, but also wrote a symphony called the Gaelic Symphony, which has won a lot of prizes and is considered one of the greatest American symphonies. I've never heard it. I'd love it to know about it if any of you have heard it. Um, she is different from every other 19th century to early 20th century composer in that she did not go to Europe for training. So probably more information than you ever want to know. We are playing two pieces from a set of three uh, that were originally composed for violin, but she did uh, also write the works for cello. And the lines are a little bit different. They're a little different figuration. The piano parts are identical. So what we want to do on Zoom is just play the opening of the third one, which we do not have recorded. We know there's kind of a time limit here and we didn't want to go too long for it. So we have the first two pre-recorded, but we'll just play the third one. It's a little bit of a suite. So this is a mazurka. Uh, and the others, you can see the names, La Captive and then a Bersus, kind of a lullaby. But we'll play this 12 measures, just the opening, just so you get a, a sense of it, and then we'll share the better recording of it. Questions before we go? All right, I will play. And now we will share. Now we will share the recording. Um, so this is what we did last night. And this is the other two pieces. Can everybody see it? Okay, you see us in different clothing. This is last night. We'll start at the beginning. I don't know why that happened. There we go. La captive.
Okay, so Hillary will talk about the next piece. I also wanted to thank Vicki for that lovely introduction. Um, that was really, and also tell you, we all, we just moved a week ago. And so you are seeing a just tuned piano last night and no art on the walls, but there will be some. <laughs> So the next piece um, that we have for you is a piece called um, In Manus to Us, and it's by Caroline Shaw. And Caroline Shaw was born. Can you hear her? Do me a come closer. Yes. Okay. Yes. Come a little closer. Um, Caroline Shaw, Shaw was born in North Carolina, and she was born not too long ago in 1982. Um, she is the youngest person to have ever won a Pulitzer Prize when she won it uh, a few years ago when she was 30 years old. So pretty remarkable. Again, probably a prodigy, plays the violin and also sings, um, started composing at a young age as well. Um, in addition to her composition, she also performs as a violinist and as a singer in several new music ensembles, including the a cappella group that she wrote her Pulitzer Prize winning composition for. She has been commissioned by nearly everybody, um, Don Upshaw, Renee Fleming, the Dover Quartet, Seattle Symphony, uh, Baltimore Symphony, the list goes on and on and on. So. Um, quite a prolific composer. And um, I wanted to read what she wrote about this piece itself. Um, so just give me a second here. It says, In Manus to Us is based on an earlier motet, in this case, that of Thomas Tallis. While there are only a few slices of the piece that reflect exact harmonic changes in Tallis's setting, the motion, or lack of, is intended to capture a sensation of a single moment of hearing the motet in a particular and remarkable space, the Christ Church in New Haven, Connecticut. In Manus to Us was written in 2009 for cellist Hannah Collins for a secular solo cello compline service that was held in the dark candlelit nave. So that can give you a little bit of a setting for this piece. Um, I've performed just an excerpt of it and it's for, as I said before, solo cello. So I hope you enjoy it. Let's see, you probably have to get rid of this. Can you see one thing or two? Okay.
I hope that was loud enough. So one of the things about Zoom is that it cuts out certain frequencies. So for instance, any kind of a drone is only there for a part of that time. So I, I noticed as I was listening that there are some things you couldn't hear, but it's a very cool piece. So, all right. Uh, the next piece that we have on here is actually a piece that was recorded as part of the Martin Luther King Day concert. And I wanted to include it here because it's by a composer named Dorothy Red Moore. And Dorothy Red Moore is a composer I've become very familiar with in the last several years or a few years. And I've just really fallen in love with her works. She's a phenomenal composer. She currently lives in New York City. Uh, she was born in Delaware in 1940 and went to Howard University where she majored in music. Um, she majored in composition, but also played the piano and sang a little bit. Um, one of her compositions was premiered at, by the National Symphony while she was in college. And then she won a, the opportunity to study with Nadia Boulanger in France. So she spent a good deal of time studying with her there while she was in college and, as, and then went back uh, to France after that. Dorothy Redmore uses her music to express her reactions and her experiences to the racial tensions that were happening during her lifetime. Um, that includes the present day and as well as, I don't know though that she's composing now, but in the 60s um, when she was really writing a lot of music. She, she says, I wanted to read this quote that is pretty powerful, I, says, I think. She says, with all the turmoil going on, I knew that I wouldn't go out, pick up a gun and kill somebody. I do have a social consciousness and I do not write music in a vacuum. But I was thinking that communicating my ideas and emotions around the world would make a difference. So she is expressing herself through her music. The piece that I have for you today is called The Weary Blues, and it's a piano trio for voice, for uh, tenor, cello, and piano. And she places a heavy 
emphasis on poetry in all of her writing. Um, but when, when she wasn't writing her own poetry, she uses that of Langston Hughes a lot of the time. And in this case, she is using a poem that he writes, um, which is called Weary Blues. Um, it's one of his very first published poems. And I'm going to read the text for you. Oh, Weary Blues. Droning in a drowsy syncopated tune, rocking back and forth to a mellow croon, I heard a Negro play. Down on Lenox Avenue the other night, by the pale dull pallor of an old gas light, he did a lazy sway. He did a lazy sway to the tune of those weary blues with his ebony hands on each ivory key, he made that poor piano moan with melody. Oh, blues, swaying to and fro on his rickety stool, he played that sad raggy tune like a musical fool. Sweet blues, coming from a black man's soul. Oh, blues. In a deep song voice with a melancholy tune, I heard that Negro sing that old piano moan. Ain't got nobody in all this world. Ain't got nobody but myself. I was gonna quit my frowning and put my troubles on the shelf. Thump, thump, thump went his foot on the floor. He played a few chords, then he sang some more. I got the weary blues and I can't be satisfied. Got the weary blues and can't be satisfied. I ain't happy no more and I wish that I had died. And far into the night he crooned that tune. The stars went out and so did the moon. The singer stopped playing and went to bed while the weary blues echoed through his head. He slept like a rock or a man that's dead. Sad, right? 
Thank you. I just wanted to introduce the two, their names are in your program, but in, in case you don't have that in front of you, the singer is Carmen White and the pianist is Futaba Niakawa. Sorry, Niakawa. So um, we had a really nice time putting that together and um, I'll actually be playing it on a CD that I'm recording over the summer. So stay tuned, you might get to hear it again with different people singing so and that uh that performance is actually on iu music live the whole martin luther king concert now is up there if you want it's a long it's like an hour an hour and a half um if you want to see it um and hillary is hoping to play a recital of a different works by women um after taba comes back so yeah we were actually rehearsing at um bev mcgahey's house before we had to she had to leave so thank you to bev for that so our last piece is very short and it's by the composer you probably have heard of the most or you've heard of her sister nadia boulanger nadia boulanger taught uh two actually current uh, professors in the music school um, Emil Naumov um, and another pianist, as well as Aaron Copeland. Uh, and George Gershwin went to study with her. I mean, she lived a very long time and was 
a fantastic teacher. Her younger sister, Lily, was also a prodigy, a little bit like uh, what we said with Amy Marcy Beach. Um, and she's six years younger than Nadia. And it appears that Nadia devoted herself to teaching in honor of Lily, which is really a lovely thing. Lily was um, quite sickly as a child. She had tuberculosis and she died in 1918. So everything that I have found says, oh, she died with tuberculosis or pneumonia or something. But that was the flu, the Spanish flu. And it makes me wonder if actually she had something with that flu, but I, I didn't find it. Um, so anyway, she wrote um, a, a whole lot of pieces for uh, chamber music. Her grandfather was a cellist, um, and so she did write some works for cello. So this one is called Nocturne, um, and it's very short, what, two minutes, two three. and a half, three minutes, something like that. Very relaxing. A lot of cello music seems to be slow and soft. Um, I think that is all. Her father was a composer. He was 77 when she was born. Her mother was a Russian princess. Really an interesting, interesting background. So we will go ahead and play this piece by Lily Boulanger. Okay, we'll take, oh. there we go. <laughs> There's our official bell. 